dangers from West Coast earthquakes, predicting damage to tall buildings from earthquake shaking. We know from Southern California Earthquake Center, they've based a new study on earthquake likelihood and models for cities, one of them being, for example, central Los Angeles. Chris Rollins and Jean-Philippe Avoac published this lately in, in the spring of 2019, before the Ridgecrest earthquakes, by the way. So it's uh, it was a foreseeing of what could happen. They say that the estimate time independent earthquake likelihoods in central Los Angeles using a model of interseismic strain accumulated and the 1932 to 2017 seismic catalog. He says, we, they say, we assume that on the long-term average, earthquakes and a seismic deformation collectively release seismic moments at a rate balancing interseismic loading. Main shocks obey the Guttenberg-Richter law up to a maximum magnitude and the Poisson process, aftershock sequences obeyed by the Richter-Gutenberg laws, and we modeled a comprehensive suit of these long-term systems, assessing how likely each system would be to have produced the MFD of the instrumental catalog. And they say, using these likelihoods, the probability estimate, the long-term MFD, we estimate maximum 6.8 magnitude plus or minus 1.5 every 300 years. And we're long due in San Francisco and Los Angeles and the middle of uh, California. They haven't had a very big earthquake in those 300 years. Now, going back to this, they estimate 6.8 at least magnitude every 300 years or about a maximum of 7. 0 0.5 magnitude, assuming a truncated or tapered Gutenberg Richter MFD. And they say our results imply that, for example, the median likelihood of one or more magnitude 6.5 main shocks is 0.2% in one year, 2% in 10 years, 18 to 21% in 100 years. As you can see, it gets uh, uh, higher as the time span increases. Now we have all these big cities with these skyscrapers on the west coast, they're beautiful and the weather is beautiful and I think California is like, what is it, the, for, if it were a country by itself it would be the 10th or 12th richest country in the world. But um, going to the uh, consideration of what would happen to these cities that have these tall buildings. Now we had the Ridgecrest earthquakes July 4th and July 5th. The 7.1 was July 5th and it was in Ridgecrest, Southern California. It was felt in Los Angeles. Thank goodness that that epicenter was not closer to Los Angeles. If it were in Los Angeles, most of the buildings there would, have, would not be standing today. As I've told you in the past, both my parents were architects in New York for major, well, big, big uh, engineering firms involved with uh, high-rise skyscraper buildings in Manhattan. And uh, they were very explicit in telling me that uh, the Manhattan skyscrapers would not stand uh, a magnitude 7 earthquake or above. They're just not built for it. It's just not feasible because it would be so expensive, the developers would never ever be able to build them. Uh, they would be so expensive to, to, uh, to, to build. Now, this is something with, I'm sorry to say that um, they, this is a costly thing to make anti-seismic skyscrapers. Now, this is something from uh, the geologists and engineers, and this is for, based on a New York Times article. Uh, it was uh, last year's, June 27, 2018, I'll leave a link below for you, by Thomas Fuller. Uh, concerning what the earthquake engineers that attended a conference in Los Angeles at that time uh, were talking about and the conclusions that they came to, 
Uh, they were talking about the tall buildings, the skyscrapers, and how safe they would be during earthquakes. Engineers had, for decades, relied on calculations that represented tremors and the convulsions that the building, buildings could endure. The convulsions meaning, of course, they're shaking. Uh, some of the world's top earthquake experts said that the projection signified underestimate and severity of shaking. They underestimated the severity of the shaking of the buildings in several West Coast cities. They underestimated the severe shaking that they would be undergoing during these earthquakes. And also, okay, uh, nothing in this article talks about the potential liquefaction of various areas that happened with the um, uh, Loma Prieta earthquakes and the bridge collapses there because certain uh, uh, pylons and columns were in areas that were very sandy and uh, it was uh, the, the, the area under, underneath those areas were had liquefied during the earthquake causing the collapse of the bridge. So you know, um, basically you have to get it, take into account not just the size of the earthquake that would be a potential uh, factor, you also have to talk to geologists to find out what's underground. A lot of buildings are, are basically designed for a general, let's say, seven magnitude earthquake, but they don't take into account what's underneath. What happens if you're building something which is on top of a cave or on top of a water, a body of water, a water, a water reservoir, which is basically an empty, you know, an empty cave under? You have maybe a couple of meters of what you think is rock, but when you have an earthquake, that thing is going to collapse and you're building with it. This is the case in a lot of uh, European cities. I'm sure it's the case somewhere, you know, as well in the United States. Um, anyway, they, that's another issue. They, they never talk, these are, the engineers and the architects never talk to geologists about what's underneath the area. Now, the research here presented at that gathering, uh, earthquake experts in Los Angeles, and the, the very major consequences that tall buildings are, are designed to uh, withstand. Cities, for example, taken into uh, consideration were Los Angeles, Salt Lake City, San Jose, Seattle. I guess San Francisco must be in there, but it's not loaded, it's not uh, mentioned here. There were some of the cities that have buildings that could suffer damages, more damage than anticipated, or in the worst case, have a greater potential for collapse. This is what the engineer said. Norman Abramson, a seismologist at the University of California in Berkeley, told hundreds of those engineers gathered at that conference, he says, there are going to be large changes coming. We now know how far off our ground motion models have been. So these are the geologists telling the architects now. He says, uh, we, are, we underestimated the shaking of the, of the earth there. So he's warning them. He says, you know, we have major quakes coming and we underestimated how much shaking is going to take place, and these buildings are not going to withstand it. He, he clear out told them. In some areas of Los Angeles County, like Century City, Culver City, Long Beach, or Santa Monica, the new projections nearly doubled the previous estimates of, dra of ground shaking in most uh, threatening, most threatening to these tall buildings, the skyscrapers. Double the threat. Another researcher, Ibi al-Mufti, an engineer with the firm Arab, said that significance of the new project was huge. He said it's going to amplify the shaking in terms of intensity, but also the duration. It's going to be more intense and it's going to last longer. God forbid. He says those two things combined can have quite a damaging effect that right now we are probably not capturing. So they're not taking that into consideration. Stronger earthquakes that last for a longer time. Okay, what a, what a horror scenario. Al-Mufti said, greater shaking could also bring out the vulnerabilities in older buildings already known to have defects. Of course, they have defects and they've probably been 
harmed and traumatized by previous earthquakes. The more earthquakes a building undergoes, the more it's unscrewed and unbuckled. <laughs> really. It's like an old woman and you're trying to put makeup on her. No matter how much makeup you're going to put on her, she's still an old woman. Right? Right. Now, the revised estimates for Los Angeles are the result of a five-year project by the Southern California Earthquake Center. This is what I just read you from, uh, and I'll leave a link below, considering uh, that they took into effect various earthquakes from 1930 to 2018, and that the likelihood of uh, main shock earthquakes are pretty large. And not only are they going to be large now, the geologists say in th these cities, they're going to be more intense and they're going to be lasting longer because their uh, estimates were way off. Uh, so for decades, the experts arrived at calculations of shaking by observing conditions in Africa, Japan, Taiwan, and other seismically active cities and uh, taking on, a, on average, but they discovered that grouping far-flung regions created imprecise estimates. So their new models now rely on local conditions, not global averages. Okay, now the West Coast, you can't rely on global average. It, it's a subduction zone, one of the worst places in the world. And so they modeled the ground more deeply there. Los Angeles model relied on measurements of thousands of local earthquakes most of them imperceptible, you can't feel them, but which offer more precise information on how seismic shock waves travel through the Earth. And let's remember a lot that we have a lot of volcanic fields just east of Los Angeles. And in most places where you have uh, strong earthquakes, you don't have volcanic fields neighboring them. And let's remember that this article was written uh, last year, way before the Ridgecrest earthquakes. So now, these new projections of shaking in Los Angeles and other cities apply to buildings of about 20 stories or more, 20 floors or more, but Professor Abramson's calculation said that they would be rolled over to the next few years would offer revisions of shaking for all structures in areas across the West Coast. In some cases, the revisions will predict lower shaking estimates than previously thought. California has not had a major earthquake since 1994, when the 6.7 magnitude earthquake struck northern Los Angeles, neighborhood of Northridge, causing widespread damage, but the seismic faults in California provide earthquakes that release well more than 50 times that energy. There are no reliable ways of knowing where and when the next big earthquake will strike. New projections have met uh, resistance by engineers because they fear that it could drive away their clients the developers will be driven away because they won't have the money to put up these buildings or renovate them. So that means that engineers and architects will be out of jobs, obviously. In Seattle, where earthquakes have the potential to be even stronger than in California, and we haven't had a Seattle earthquake, and that is predicted for a huge one, uh, it's way overdue. It's way overdue. The last one was in 1700, a 9 magnitude, 9.3, I think, and it caused the ghost tsunami that hit Japan, and they figured that it was coming from uh, that area of uh, the West Coast. And the geologists found from sediments that this takes place every 300 years. It's, it's been over 300 years now. 1700, 2000, we're 20, about 20 years overdue. So uh, the earthquakes here have the potential to be stronger than in California. And engineers will be required to take into account new projections of shaking that are 33% higher than the older ones. This is what C.B. Cruz, Krauss, expert in ground motions, who helped write the new guidelines, says. Mr. Krauss said this is a significant increase from the standpoint of building design. Krauss said, but because of the pushback by the engineers in Seattle, the use of new projects in building codes has been delayed. The structural engineer said it's really going to cause a problem with the developments up here, they said. They said, we can't institute this immediately. We have to incorporate it slowly. We have not settled on how. Even more difficult is the question how to handle existing buildings in the area where the ground shaking is projected to be 
much higher. These cities and buildings are already in place. So what to do? Now what do we do? This is what the Earthquake Engineering Research California, Laboratory California Institute of Technology says. Well, now what do we do? That's the question. At a time of severe shortage of housing in California, where the median home price is above $600,000, requiring retrofits to these would be an added and heavy financial burden. Yeah, but what can you do? It's a matter of life and death, you guys. It's a matter of life and death. What are you just going to do? Just, uh, you know, hear no evil, see no evil? That's not going to work. John Vidal, the director of the Southern California Earthquake Center, said the revised projections would ultimately help the engineers. But what we're doing is mapping up things more precisely. We're making more accurate maps, and we're shrinking the uncertainties. And this is one thing that the, the architects and engineers don't like. What, they don't like that because the developers are not just going to don't have the money to put up these buildings or even retrofit them. So that's as, as again they said, they delayed the changing of the building codes. I'm sitting here sighing because since this article was written June 27, 2018, a year later. It was by God's providence, and that's my uh, will to say so, that those earthquakes in Ridgecrest did not hit closer to Los Angeles. And just like the geologists and the officials had stated themselves, they were lucky this time. This time they were lucky because it didn't hit a major city. But it's just a matter of time. So they had ample warning. They had ample warning last year from the geologists, Southern California Earthquake Center. They had ample warning by the actual event that took place in Ridgecrest. And instead, by the way, it's still shaking there. So what to do? What are they going to do? What are they going to do? I guess now uh, it's up to every person that owns a building in those areas to retrofit them themselves as best they know how and pay for it, of course. So I'll leave links below for you for this. If you'd like to join me on my Patreon account, you will hear content not covered by mainstream media. These riveting stories will be based on my research and I will state my opinions and give my personal insight on diverse and controversial subjects and world events, events not covered by mainstream media and not certainly on not supported by YouTube guidelines. So whatever I have on my Patreon, most of those will not be on my YouTube channel. Please consider becoming a member today. More of the, the most significant and important videos will be on my Patreon channel. Your support helps me to continue my research and keeps this YouTube channel alive. And we depend on your support, your generous charity, because we help economically challenged families here in Athens, Greece, in Kapota, and we also help the young generation with university tuition and the community around our church. Thank you.